Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Good morning. It is good to be together again. Whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary or remotely via Zoom or watching this recording later, it's good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. We call this connection opportunity, greeting our virtual neighbors. First, we will project an image on the screen of folks who are currently on Zoom and ask them to turn their cameras on and give us a wave. Yay, good morning. And then we here who are gathered in the sanctuary will turn to face the camera in the back and give everybody on Zoom a wave. If you are visiting us for the first time, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. If you are with us in the sanctuary, we invite you to join us after service in our social hall, which is located to the left as you exit the sanctuary. Uh, if you are on Zoom, we invite you to stay on the call for a virtual coffee hour immediately after the service. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC at home, on campus, in the world, every day. We are Birmingham Unitarian Church, and we are building the beloved community. As Julia lights the chalice flame, these words by Eric Heller Wagner. Blessed is the fire that burns deep in the soul. It is the flame of the human spirit touched into being by the mystery of life. It is the fire of reason, the fire of compassion, the fire of community, the fire of justice, the fire of faith. It is the fire of love burning deep in the human heart the divine glow in every life. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit and join in singing hymn 322, Thanks Be For These. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Reverend Connie Grant, minister of this congregation for the next two years. I'm trained and experienced as an interim minister to work with congregations in transitional times. But I've come to believe that we're all in transitional times all the time. 
I don't think of myself as your temporary minister, and I hope that you won't think of me that way either. I'm your minister for now, and I think that's different. Some things will change and change some more during this time, and most importantly, I hope to build relationships with you individually and collectively as your minister for now. My sermon topic today is TBD, which doesn't mean that I'm going to be making it up as I go along. <laughs> These opening words. We gather in religious communities celebrating the gifts of life, recognizing our part in the greater wholeness, lifting up those things that are worthy of our attention learning to be our best selves. So I'd like to read a story to you this morning. And I think perhaps there are some children and youth present, and that would be great because this story works best with audience participation. And I hope that you'll all help in reading this story. Um, so, this is your part. Could be good, could be bad. It's too soon to tell. Would you practice, please? <laughs> could be good, could be bad. It's too soon to tell. So I'll give you your cue as we go along. Once there was a farmer who had one horse and one son and his horse and his son were the most important things in the world to him. One day, the farmer's horse ran off. And when the neighbors heard what had happened, knowing how important the farmer's horse was to him, they came to him to commiserate. We heard your horse ran off, and we want you to know we think that is just terrible, awful, and just plain bad. And the farmer said, could be good, could be bad, it's too soon to tell. The next day, the horse returned, bringing a herd of seven wild horses with him. The neighbors came to the farmer and said, we heard you now have eight horses, and we just want you to know we think that is wonderful, fantastic, and just really good. And the farmer said, could be good, could be bad, it's too soon to tell. The next day, the farmer's son tried to ride one of the wild horses, but the horse threw him off and he broke his leg. The neighbors said, excuse me. The neighbors said, we heard your son broke his leg and we want you to know that we think that is such a shame, a true misfortune, and just really, really bad. And the farmer said, could be good, could be bad, it's too soon to tell. The next day, soldiers showed up at the door to draft the farmer's son into the army. But since he had broken his leg, the son was eligible for a deferment. The neighbors said, we're so happy for you. That's just the best thing that ever happened, and it's just really, really good. And the farmer said, could be good, could be bad, it's too soon to tell. And of course, that's really not the end of the story. But it is time for any children, youth, and their facilitators who are present to meet at the back of the sanctuary to head to their activities. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. 
One way we live out this mission is by giving half our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas. Environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. This month's plate collection recipient is the Michigan Leave of Conservation Voters. The MLCV is a nonprofit organization that aims to protect Michigan's air, land, and water by activating voters to elect and hold accountable public officials who fight for an environment that sustains the health and well being of us all. Their current initiatives include healthy Great Lakes, safe, affordable drinking water, clean air and climate action, preserving parks and public land, voting access and protecting democracy and environmental justice. This organization is living our shared values of respect for the interdependent web of life of which we are all a part. This is one of the organizations building the world we want to live in. And for that, we are supporting them with half of our collected offering. We will receive today's offering with gratitude. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We hold each other in our hearts and minds with all our joys and all our sorrows. The joys and sorrows of the congregation that are shared with us this morning are these.
from Andy and Mary Masson. They're celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary. And they say it's been a great ride. And Dick and Carol Wiseman celebrated 57 years of marriage last week. They were married here at BUC in 1967 by Rabbi Sherwin Wine. From Mary Samal, this Tuesday, my brother Martin Robick, the older of my two younger brothers, lost his battle with mantle cell lymphoma, a rare cancer that occurs primarily in men of European origin. As CPA, Marty was generous to his family and community with his time and money. Mary says, my little brother gave me sound financial advice that I was smart enough to take. I will also miss his sharp wit. He made sure that his big sister's head did not become too swollen. <laughs> and from Carol Hayford, please keep us in your thoughts as my husband Rick undergoes open heart surgery this coming Thursday. We remember those experiencing losses and those facing health challenges. We pray in whatever way we pray for all those affected by war, by hatred and violence. We pray for peace. Even when the cares of the world weigh on us, may we find joy in our connection with each other and in the pleasures that life holds. Let us care for one another and for ourselves in all the ways we can. As we hold each other in our hearts and minds with all our joys and all our sorrows, whether spoken or unspoken, let's take a moment to be quiet together. Yes, by William Stafford. It could happen any time. Tornado, earthquake, Armageddon. It could happen. Or sunshine, love, salvation. It could, you know. That's why we wake and look out. No guarantees in this life. But some bonuses like morning, like right now, like noon, like evening, like right now. Let's sing together in 123, Spirit of Life. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of
reading, Fault Lines by Robert Walsh. Do you ever think there might be a fault line passing underneath your living room? A place in which your life is lived in meaning and in separating, wondering and telling, unaware that just beneath you is the unseen seam of great plates the, that strain through time? And your life, and that your life, already spilling over the brim, could be invaded, sent off in a new direction, turned aside by forces you were warned about but not prepared for? Shelves could be spilled out, the level floor set at an angle in some seconds shaking? You would have to take your losses, do whatever must be done next. When the great plates slip and the earth shivers and the flaw is seen to lie in what you trusted most, look, lot, look not to more solidity, to weighty slabs of concrete poured or strength of cantilevered beam to save the fractured order. Trust more the tensile strands of love that bend and stretch to hold you in the web of life that's often torn, but always healing. There's your strength. The shifting plates, the rest of earth, your room, your precious life, they all proceed from love, the ground on which we walk together.
title of my sermon today is To Be Determined. This title makes me think of a sort of Abbott and Costello routine. Who's on first? That's right. What's the title of your sermon? It's to be determined. What's your sermon about? It's about 20 minutes. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes or so, and maybe a little less, is to be determined. Can we determine the course of our lives, or is the course of our lives to be determined? What is the role of determination in our lives, and what is simply beyond our control? The farmer said, what did the farmer say? Could be good, could be bad, it's too soon to tell. And of course, that's really not the end of the story. In real life, something happens, we respond, something else happens, and we respond again. In real life, we break a leg, leave a job, or a relationship ends. Or we escape a disaster, find meaningful employment, or begin a friendship or a romance. And we have to figure out what to do, how to be, who to be. I sometimes ask participants in credo building workshops to represent their individual beliefs about a series, <coughs> excuse me, about a series of theological questions by moving to one of the corners of the room or choosing a point in a line or raising their hands. And then I ask a few of them to say a few words about why they've chosen their particular position. One of my favorite questions to is to ask about fate, that is, by circumstances beyond your control and free will. Which do you think most influences your life? So let's try that right now. Which do you think most influences your life? Fate? A few, a few. And free will? A lot. When I do a series of questions with a group, I myself sometimes choose different positions at different times in response to some of the questions representing my own contrarian approach. But for the question, excuse me, I think I need a sip of water. Which I believe is right over here. Thank you so much. For the question about fate and free will, I always cho choose a point near the center of the line. My reason is that I believe that you have to take the cards you are dealt and play them, even if you're dealt a lousy hand. I grew up with a sermon preached by my mother, who was not a minister, but a parent who preached the occasional sermon, not, not, nevertheless, as parents do. The sermon went like this. Our lives depend not on what happens to us, but on how we respond to what happens. Of course, the sermon was not original to my mother, but has been preached in many forms before and since. The psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, in his book Man's Search for Meaning, wrote of his experiences in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany. He wrote, everything can be taken from a person but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Frankel wrote that even in the concentration camp, there were always choices to make. Every day, every hour, offered the opportunity to make a decision decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of your very self. 
your inner freedom, which determined whether you would become the plaything of circumstance. For my mother, the belief that our lives depend not on what happens to us, but on how we respond to what happens, was a belief that she lived, not just a belief that she talked about. When my mother was nearly as old as I am now, she suffered a stroke that resulted in almost total paralysis. She'd had a tracheotomy, so she spoke in a whisper that few could understand. She couldn't swallow, so she received nourishment through a nasogastric tube. One of her few remaining physical abilities was that she could use her left hand. She was left-handed. She could use her left hand to pluck a tissue from the box and wipe her nose. And it was important that, to her that she could take care of herself, at least in that small way. Through physical therapy, my mother achieved infinitesimal improvement, enough to sit up in a chair for brief periods each day and to enjoy eating a spoonful or two of yogurt when it was fed to her. And yet, until the end of her life, her mind and her spirit remained as strong as ever. She remained engaged and interested and loved nothing more than a good conversation. A couple of years after my mother died, my uncle Art, my mother's only brother, faced his own imminent death from lung cancer. One day, Uncle Art asked me a question that I'm sure he didn't expect me to answer at all. He asked me how my mother had been able to keep up what he called her good attitude until the end. Somehow I found an answer to my uncle's rhetorical question. After a long moment, I responded that I thought my mother believed in taking the cards she had been dealt and playing them. Even when we are faced with circumstances beyond our control, how can we keep on playing the game? As Viktor Frankl suggested, our response is what we ourselves can determine. Of course, there are many things beyond our control. Our genetic legacies, the social locations and physical locations into which we are born, even our innate dispositions. What will we do with those elements of our lives that are beyond our control? If we are believe we are controlled by fate, then we are. If we believe we have free will, then we do. An article in the Atlantic magazine was titled, There's No Such Thing as Free Will, but we're better off believing in it anyway. So many of you believe in free will. And that's a good thing. But the article reviews research on the inner workings of the brain helping to resolve questions about whether our actions are the unfolding effect of our genetics, of the outcome of what has been imprinted on us by the environment. High-tech scanners, says the article, have helped resolve the nature nurture debate by demonstrating that the intricate networks of neurons in the brain are shaped by both genes and environment. And there's agreement in the scientific community that the firing of neurons determines not just some or most, but all of our thoughts, hopes, memories, and dreams. A book that I just started reading is titled I believe it's the random effect, which talks about chance and luck and the role of those in our lives. And as he's explaining it, I think that much of his approach has to do with what I would consider um, things beyond our control, not just luck and chance, but what I've been calling fate, those things beyond our control. So all of those are factors in our lives. With adequate support, the human capacity for resilience seems almost limitless. 
Individually and collectively, we survived tragedies that we would not have imagined were survivable. One definition of resilience is the capacity of a system, enterprise, or a person to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. According to a book titled Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back, characteristics of personal resilience include the belief that one can find a meaningful purpose in life, the belief that one can influence one's surroundings and the outcome of events, and the belief that positive and negative experiences will lead to learning and growth. In real life, something happens, we respond, something else happens, and we respond again. Our lives depend on the interplay of complex forces, and our actions and reactions are the result of all that has gone before, both inside and outside ourselves. We want to know the future. We want to control the future. A 2020 book titled Uncharted, How to Map the Future Together, details many of the ways our models for knowing the future let us down. Yet the author suggests that our choice is not between false certainty and ignorance. It is between false certainty and participation. She notes that transformative scenarios reveal and develop unseen possibilities, changing both people and problems through radical diversity and confrontation. She suggests approaching the future with fervent curiosity and methodology that progresses with questions. What do we need to do now? What do we need to be now? What must we preserve at all cost? In a real sense, the future is not only uncharted, but unmappable. We haven't been there yet. When the present keeps changing, the future keeps changing too. Individually and collectively, we are also changed and keep changing. We've experienced profound cultural shifts. We've experienced deep grief over losses in our personal and collective lives. Have we also reached new awareness of injustices and inequities in our society? We may have once thought that we'd find a new normal once we emerged from the crisis of global pandemic. But too many things have changed in our lives and in our world. I've come to believe that the new normal isn't some static place that we'll eventually get to. The new normal is that things will keep changing for the foreseeable and unforeseeable future. In our lives, there are always constraints and limitations, and there are always opportunities and possibilities. Our task, our challenge, is to discern and respond to the needs of the present. And I think that to be able to live with determination and to, to determine the course of our lives, we have to understand that those possibilities exist that the possibilities of changing our lives for the better are before us and that we can make them happen. In an article published in Anthropology Magazine titled The Pandemic and the Process of Becoming, the author says that people find themselves in a prolonged liminal state of transition. She posits that the individual who emerges, emerges on the other side of a liminal event is not the same as the individual who entered it. This process is unsettling. It requires a separation from cultural attachments and a fundamental dissolution of the usual mental and social structures that guide and shape us as people. During liminal periods, things as we know them dissolve and become reinvented gender norms, social hierarchies, or cognitive categories, 
Each may be rendered ambiguous and fluid. She says that she wants to believe that liminal moments are nearly boundless in their revelatory potential. Untethered from our entrenched ways of being and thinking, we are free to reimagine the very tenets of our knowledge, to juggle with the factors of existence. Liminal spaces are infused with hope and possibility. The author of the book Uncharted notes that imagination, creativity, compassion, generosity, variety, meaning, faith, and courage. What makes the world unpredictable are also the strengths that make, make each of us unique and human. Accepting uncertainty means embracing these as robust talents to be used, not flaws to be eliminated. And she suggests that what we need to do is to hold fast to the gifts we have and to develop them together. What we need to be is human. The future will always be uncharted, she reminds us, but it is made by those active enough to explore it, with the stamina and imagination not to give up on themselves or each other. She suggests that the only way to know the future is to make it. We continue to live in liminal times of unpredictable duration. Can we live with hope and possibility in these ongoing times of uncertainty? The only way to know the future is to make it. A National Geographic article noted that the stones of the buildings at Machu Picchu, the so-called lost city of the Inca in Peru, are cut so precisely that they snugly fit together without mortar. Constructed on top of two fault lines under the earth, Machu Picchu often experiences earthquakes. The stones are wedged so closely together that when an earthquake occurs, the stones in an Inca building are said to dance. That is, they bounce to the tremors and then fall back into place. May we be like the stones of Machu Picchu, holding each other close in a dance that helps us withstand the earthquakes that shake us. As we live on the fault lines upon which our lives are built, may we trust the tensile strand, strands of love that bend and stretch to hold us in the web of life that's often torn but always healing. And now I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join in singing hymn 295, Sing Out Praises for the Journey. in the soul's deep yearnings like our forebears in their time. We seek out the Spirit's wholeness in the endless human quest. Look inside your souls, the kindling of the heart our pilgrims knew. Find the spirit always restless, find it in each mind and heart. Touch and hold that ancient yearning, kindling for a new found truth. Stand we now upon the threshold, facing futures yet unknown. Heart behind us, wayside hostile, 
built by those who knew wild roads. Guard we ere their sacred embers carried in our minds and hearts. As we extinguish the chalice flame, these words by Lisa Friedman. We live in a fragmented world that tempts us to despair. We would put it back together piece by piece if it were ours to choose. But sometimes the fragments are enough. In a world of cruelty, there is still power in every act of kindness. In a time of doubt, there is still power in every act of hope. In an age of division, there is still power in every act of unity. We, rem we remember that sometimes the fragments of meaning we make are just the right size to hold in our hands. And may we live our lives fully and creatively so that we may be a blessing to ourselves, to each other, and to all those whose lives we touch. Go in peace.